I don't see her, but I could follow up and see if she's going to hop on. Okay. I just noticed that Electa was in the attendee section, so I just promoted her to a panelist. Oh, great. You want to just keep an eye out for Leah then? Yes, she'll be on shortly. All right. Oh, we're live on Facebook. Okay, um, we're gonna get started here of just providing some background information on um, where we're at for the event today. Um, apologies if, uh, if some of, of our audience have already heard it, but we just wanna uh, provide a you know, reminder of how this event is working. My name is Dan Cornelius, I work for the Intertribal Agriculture Council. And how this event is structured today is we have the live sessions uh, that are continuing throughout the day we just concluded the culinary chef mentors. We're about to start the indigenous seed keeping. And um, you know, if, if you're new to joining in, I wanna just clarify, we've got the schedule up on here. If you can see on your screen, we've got traditional foods, culinary and production policy workshops. All of those are pre-recorded, they're on demand. They're on the IACE learning platform that is available at Mighty Networks. If you register for the event, at Intertribal Food Summit 2020.eventbrite.com. Um, within with the, that registration, you'll have more information on how to access that platform. But as you can see, we've got a, a couple of dozen workshops on there. We also have a separate workshop on traditional foods, uh, aside from the virtual Intertribal Food Summit workshop, that has hours and hours and hours of past content from um, from other in-person uh, uh, intertribal food summits. So that's a, ba a basic background on the event. And we want to share just another, um, another initiative that the Intertribal Agriculture Council is doing. We are collecting a series of surveys. And um, Latasha is going to share a really short video talking about those surveys. You can find these surveys. Yeah. You can find these surveys if you go to the Intertribal Ag website, uh, indianag.org backslash resilient. Hey everybody, Kier Johnson Ray is here with Intertribal Agriculture Council. I'd like to talk about participating in IAC's surveys. Help us shape Indian Ag's COVID-19 responses. Go to indianag.org slash resilient. You'll find four surveys covering tribal producers, tribal and community leaders, American Indian foods participants, community grocers, food hubs, and cooperatives. The preliminary results are indicating tremendous impacts across Indian countries' ag sectors as a result of COVID-19. We're noticing issues in workforce reduction, sales, supply chain, and loss of cash reserves. 
The important information you provide to us helps us inform local and national programming and curriculum development for remote learning opportunities. USDA and partner organizations, agencies, and philanthropy have indicated a strong interest in reviewing ISC's results to inform their programming as well. Your participation truly is shaping the future of Indian agriculture during the COVID-19 era and beyond. Preliminary results indicate decisive need for assistance to support overall community food systems, access to financing, networking, and professional development. We're learning about the extent of supply chain impacts and the inherent opportunities for our tribal producers in the marketing of their products directly. There is strong interest to buy from Indian country producers. Help us educate Congress with regard to our community's needs during COVID-19 and beyond. ISC is seeking your support to provide the data we rely upon as Indian country's voice in food, agriculture, and natural resource management. Go to indianag.org slash resilient to bring light to your community's needs. Scroll down to the share your stories section. If you're involved in our virtual intertribal food summit, we're asking that you take our five minute survey as part of your participation in the summit. Thank you. Thank you. So again, you can uh, you can take those surveys by going to indianag.org backslash resilient, and uh, we're going to be sharing more of the results later on today. It is uh, it's important as Intertribal Ag Council, Native Farm Bill Coalition, and other partners are working to advocate at both to Congress and to our tribal leaders on where they're where where we need more support. So this is part of the opportunity to really make a. a you know, policy changes and bring more resources and support to our communities, as well as putting together other initiatives to, to help to just strengthen our intertribal connections. Turn it over to Electa. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate everything you've done. All right. So today we're going to have a seed keeping roundtable. And I know as um, a seed keeper myself or a seed keeper in training that we probably will see a few of our other panelists be popping in, drying off their hands from working out in the field, uh, taking care of the corn. And so you uh, faces pop up throughout the panel, just know that's part of a uh, seed keeper's life. We're always on call, always on demand, and we always appreciate doing the work. So, um, today is Saturday, June 20th. It's a solstice weekend. Uh, I want to again thank our sponsors and also um, I come to you with a good heart and thank you for all the minutes and the hours and the seasons that you have invested in your own gardens in learning more about traditional um, keeping of seeds and also um, just learning more about yourself while you're in the garden and I think that that's one thing that I'm really appreciative that my mentor Deb Echohawk is here um, today on the call. And then Leah Zizi, if you want to chip in at any time, I know that you are involved in braiding the sacred and we'd be happy to hear from you. But my first question for you is, I'd love to hear a little bit of the introduction. I'd love to hear a little bit of your language if you'd like to share. And uh, feel free to tell me where you're from and a little bit about what you're doing today, this morning as a seed keeper. I'll go ahead and go with um, Deb. Hello, my name is Deb Echohawk, Joshua Hukuts, and I am a Kikahaki Pawnee, um, live in Pawnee, Oklahoma, and uh, I'm really, really happy to be with uh, uh, this group, and it's good to see Leah again, and, and uh, of course, always good to see Electa, and I look forward to learning from you. Thank you. Leah? Hello, everyone. My name is Leah. Um, I'm Oneida from Wisconsin. I'm Wolf Clan, um, and I work as the Eastern Region Technical Assistance Specialist for Intertribal Agriculture Council. And as part of that, I work 
on something called Braiding the Sacred, which is a network of native corn growers. So I'm here to chime in a little bit about that until we can get Angela Ferguson on. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate that. You know, um, one of the things that I have come to know uh, from coming to the regional food summits and to interacting with other seed keepers is that the work is always goes back to being relational, being relational to um, Mother Earth, being relational to our waterways, um, being relational to just the simplest, smallest seed, and then learning of its power. And um, so I just wanted to touch base with you about some of the relational aspects, whether that be across cultures or whether that be um, between families and tribal communities, what are some of the kinship and relational aspects that you have seen through being affiliated and working with uh, Atira Dakisu, Mother Corn? That's kind of a, a big question here um, because it, it, it's, it's so intertwined with everything that we do, uh, whether it's, it's uh, working with our, our powers that be, we, we work with the Nisharo uh, Council of Chiefs and um, uh, their request for uh, this the corn soup for their ceremonies is, is real important. If that helps us to connect with our, our uh, spirit world, our ancestors. And, and um, um, every kernel, every, every bit of our corn is, is sacred. It's alive. And it teaches us all the time. And so that one-on-one -on -one relationship is very important. Um, we see a lot of healing with those that are working close with it. And uh, we always encourage those um, to have an open mind when they go in the garden, in the open heart, and, and um, just see what lessons they can receive. And Leah, if you could just turn up your um, uh, mic a little bit or your speaker um, a little louder, that would be helpful. We got a, um, a request from the crowd, but thank I you. I saw that. I'm just gonna have to put my face right here. <laughs> it's my, I have an older computer. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> up close and personal this morning. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, with um, in Oneida at least, with the Ohilagu Cooperative, I've seen a lot of intergenerational relationships be strengthened by working with the corn. Um, we do a lot of our work by hand. So hand planting, hand harvesting, husking, and then braiding up. Um, so we get to spend a lot of time together, a lot of time with our fingers in the dirt or with our hands on corn. And I think that's really improved our relationships with each other, but then also with the earth um, and understanding all of the beings that we share this place with. And it's expanded now into tool making, traditional tool making. So now we have to even get to know more relatives, um, the trees and um, sweet grass and those kinds of things that we, that we you know, bring in as elements of tool making. So I think um, relationships have only gotten stronger. Um, you know, trust has been built between people by just working alongside one another and working with the corn. I sure can appreciate your perspective and um, you're absolutely right. Sometimes um, when we have newcomers who haven't worked with the corner or um, seen a full growing season yet, um, you can almost feel their nervousness. And I think that that over time, it, it goes away because it's just a really natural inherent thing that we do, um, that we've done for a long time before the US Department of Agriculture, uh, before extension, you know, they never taught us these things. These were things that we did as a part of our societies. And so um, I'm just really appreciative to see the love that's on your face and the, um, the expressions from your heart about um, taking care of the seed and learning from the seed and the soil. So I really appreciate that. I wanted to share a little story about um, a Pawnee Seed Preservation Project harvest last fall. And so uh, I'm gonna share it and then you all can reflect on if you connect with anything that I have, have said. Last October, 
our own Pawnee Seed Preservation Project saw the largest group harvest of people who were harvesting with or who were assisting with the harvest. Um, many of the people came from Oklahoma, where we currently reside, back to our homelands in Nebraska, and we gathered um, blue corn and some eagle corn um, that had been grown in Nebraska near Pleasantdale with a partner grower. And so, like going back to seeing people harvest for the first time, maybe in generations, maybe in hundreds of years, in their line of family. As our group was sorting the corn, we shook back our husks and were guided to identify the blue corn that we were sorting into three different categories. We sorted it into food, into seed, and at that time, what we called distinguished. It was kind of pretty, it had a color, a sheen, maybe it had some gemish tones to it. So it was really gorgeous and it wasn't quite what we would just um, grind for corn, you know, meal. I just wanted to pause and say it was a beautiful thing to see an elder and our young ones recognize the beauty and the power of agricultural biodiversity. I know that's a scientific English term, but I don't think there's a word in the English language for what maize is to us. Um, if you're comfortable, can you share a little bit about being, what being close to seed means to you? And this will be for, um, go ahead, Leah, and then we'll let Dead go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've had an opportunity to meet a lot of seeds um, in the last couple of years, and it's been a really uh, inspiring experience just to see how much diversity um, and how much love and care has been put into so many seed varieties across Turtle Island. Um, and so I think um, just in the last couple of years, we started growing more of the different Haudenosaunee varieties in Oneida and a lot more varieties from all over Turtle Island through the Bringing the Sacred Network. Um, and so I feel like my love for corn has just grown in just seeing that diversity and variety of seeds. Um, and it's really amazing too to learn about the different way that different um, varieties of seeds are used for different medicinal purposes and different ceremonial purposes. And it really just like strengthens that understanding of the sacredness of the seeds. Um, and so I think I, it's really hard for me to pick one seed that I could talk about in depth, but um, yeah, I just wanted to say that it's really amazing how many tribes have maintained those relationships and, are, and continue to work to strengthen the relationship with the corn. Deb? That, oh, I don't know, talking about our favorite corn is it's impossible <laughs> because they all have beautiful strengths and um, um, I mean with with our project or um, we're, we're calling it uh, Rehesa which is a good word for tomorrow um, we we do this now you know so that we can have it for our our uh, next generation but in the meanwhile um i'm i'm just really happy with with uh how the corn is presenting itself um it with the help of our mother corn um we've been able to bring back corn that we thought was extinct um you know we had writers uh, around 1915 and then prior to that our um uh, our own james r murray had written about a variety that was no longer available and yet it reappeared and it's been 150 years since that corn was grown. Um, so we're, we're really on a seed adventure. Every variety that we have is uh, a gift. And it's a sacred gift and it's one that we spend a lot of time on uh, to check its health and um, just make sure that it's well, you know, and, and, and so that when we 
get ready for our seed blessing and distribution time that um, the seeds ready to, to go back in the ground and start that uh, a cycle. And we hope that at this time, you know, that we don't have any um, seed that goes extinct again, you know, that we, we really want it to nurture um, our, our diets or our families. That, and uh, uh, so we have a lot to look forward to. Um, it's all precious. I agree. We have, um, I know we have two other panelists that we're trying to get on today and I want to acknowledge their efforts and um, hopefully we'll see them on the call. Um, Angela Ferguson, as well as Stephen McComer. And um, I met Angela here in Oklahoma at a Braiding the Sacred event. And just to see her, um, her strength and advocacy for um, these corn ways and for seed keeping practices was a really beautiful thing. Um, I'm just trying to count up in my head the years of seed keeping experience between the three of us on the call. Um, and then also try to account for maybe the seed keeping years that they have. But when we count those years, we also have to count our ancestors years too. So um, we, we acknowledge that too. I see Stephen has joined us and he's just connecting to audio. So we're happy to hear from him. Uh, I met Stephen last year in April at the regional food summit that Dan had helped put on um, with all his wonderful team in Pokagon, Michigan. So it's really nice to be connected at a national level with this food summit. And um, Stephen, can you hear me? <laughs> He's trying to get his audio going. So we'll give him a time. But one thing that really resonated with me, um, especially coming from a, a male figure around um, the seed talk, was um, Mr. McComer, um, we all met and it, we were in a, a, just a small lodge where we were visiting and talking about rematriation of seed and how sometimes we had originally lost our ancestral varieties of seed. Um, and so we had talked about how universities and museums had, had become a holding place for seeds, but we we're reflecting on how those seeds had been acquired and taken away from us or, um, you know, had been separated from us at one point in our history and time. And I was able to share just a little of my story of it, my entry into seed keeping thanks to Deb Echohawk and my grandma. And um, I just appreciate Stephen for acknowledging a few of the things that I said and appreciating the things that I said because I was speaking from my heart and my own personal experience. And Stephen McComer, he, um, he gently looked in my eyes and said, I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate what you said. And that meant a lot, that meant so much. Um, and so Stephen, I just wanted to um, say hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yay, I'm so glad to have you on the call. And I just wanted to ask you, just to kick it off, we often say um, being close to mother corn and corn and seed keeping relations that we do not keep the seed, the seed keeps us and teaches us. So can you elaborate how being in service to the seed banks and learning the seasonal cycles, how has that shaped you as a seed keeper? That's for you, Stephen, and then we'll go around. Wow. Big question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big question. Go ahead and feel free to introduce yourself too for the audience. Yes, well, if you can hear me, yeah, my name is uh, Steve McCumber or Silver Bear. And um, I, um, I've been growing uh, corn now close to 50 years. And um, in the early 1980s, I, I got involved with the Seed Savers Exchange. And through their yearbook, I met uh, different people. Uh, up until that time, I was uh, growing a lot of varieties, but uh, during the time I uh, became a member of the Seed Savers, I met a gentleman named Doug Eaglin, and, um, and he didn't live too far from here, but we finally connected, and he said to me, he says, well, he knew a little bit about me, like, after we met, and he says, oh, he says, 
you travel throughout the, uh, the, the Iroquois Confederacy or the Haudenosaunee. And I, I said, yeah. And, I, and he says, you seem to know a lot of people. And so he said, uh, maybe you should concentrate on your own varieties within your own nations. So I thought, why not? Uh, but up till that uh, time, I was already working on uh, breeding or selecting uh, uh, varieties of corn on my own. And I was doing some things that some people said, well, you can't do that with the corn. But I seem to maybe have uh, proved otherwise. And I gave it much thought and I was wondering, well, uh, how did our forefathers do it? You know, uh, to say they were modern scientists. No, they were ancient scientists that applied, uh, you know, our indigenous knowledge uh, uh, and heritage uh, application to the connection of the seed, the land, ceremony, and all of this together is all combined with, with that knowledge to make things happen. So I started doing those things. So when I met Doug, um, we... Um, uh, from that point on, uh, I still had traveled a lot throughout the, throughout the Six Nations. I've gone out to Tonawanda, I've gone out to Allegheny and Cataraugus. And then uh, eventually in the early uh, uh, 1980, I started to go to Six Nations. And from there, I met a few people and I became friends. And uh, one of the things that at that time was, uh, you know, to get uh, corn. And at that time, we in, in our longhouses back here in the east, we weren't very, say, uh, rich with a lot of, uh, say, material culture and even some of the ceremonies. Uh, we had just begun to revive them and, and, and we learned them at that point. And at one time, I was asked in regards to that, I said, well, there was many things that happened. Uh, and especially some of it were like uh, effects of residential school where grandparents were taken away. And, and so a lot of that knowledge and different things was lost. So going to Six Nations and meeting different people uh, and starting to learn uh, through ceremony that uh, they had used different type of uh, corn uh, for different kind of uh, ceremonies. So it began there. And then at some point, my theory was that uh, if it wasn't for, say, some of these ceremonies, perhaps some of these varieties would be lost and they were being preserved uh, by, uh, in relationship to, uh, you know, the application of ceremony, which is uh, everything goes in hand in hand. Uh, there's no separation in uh, Native cultures, no separation between uh, practice, uh, uh, putting your hand in the soil to uh, participating in the longhouse and, uh, and what, uh, what supplied uh, knowledge uh, to growing that seed. And also uh, keeping in mind and also giving back and sharing. So that's the biggest thing. And so when I went to different communities, I remember Corbett Sundown in Tonawanda one time and he said to me, oh, he says, Steve, he says, do you grow this kind of bean in Ganawage? And I says, uh, no. So he just went on and he got a great big bag. He just gave me the whole thing. I was kind of overwhelmed with the, uh, their type of generosity. But, you know, this is the way our old people were. And, and in a roundabout way, it's also ensuring uh, the maintenance uh, of, of certain things by sharing with other communities, hoping they'll have luck. And also, uh, like in our language, to make it stronger again, uh, because grown in different locations and so on and so forth. And so um, over the years, uh, and then after a while, these people would get to know me, and then all of a sudden people would be giving me, giving me things. So I started growing them out. Uh, at, at, uh, in those early years, I had uh, several garden places, so I could grow maybe about uh, six varieties of corn uh, every, every season and keeping them pure. And then as I went along, I began to learn more about uh, the pollination and so forth. And uh, then also even the length of time that they grow. And I remember the first old man at Six Nations, his name was uh, Sam Green. And he had one, two, he had two varieties that he grew that never cross pollinated. And they were growing uh, fairly close to each other. Then in an adjacent field, another gentleman grew a uh, commercial variety for, for feed. And there was never any crossing in there. So in time, I learned that the corns all pollinated at different times. And maybe that's what helped it. And so, um, uh, and so it's just something that I did that was part of me. Uh, I never thought, well, one day I'm going to be kind of uh, known as a seed keeper or seed saver. It's something that you live. 
And yeah. so all these all these names that people apply, well, you're a sea keeper, you're the guardian, you're this, you're that, and whatever. It's all kind of okay, but I never thought about it back then. And I still don't, I have a hard time to refer to myself uh, in that way today. But um, it's just something that I was done. And now, you know, I teach my grandchildren and they, they're they working. Uh, presently, I'm involved in a, a, a community project uh, uh, with uh, mounds of uh, three sisters. So we started with um, uh, Tuscarora corn, white corn, and then uh, the mounds were built and we planted that. I planted some Buffalo Creek squash there and then we pr uh, planted some corn squash. And in the by the next weekend, then we're gonna bean our corn. I call it beaning our corn. So uh, I'm gonna put a variety that's gonna go on, on the corn. And you need to uh, time them just right and then also you need a variety that's uh, suited to climb on the corn because there are some pole beans that grow so tall and will uh, pull your corn stalks down so the old-fashioned corn stalk bean what is referred to or twiner are excellent varieties so go against corn and so it's it's all incorporated but more than that there's uh, there are um, different things that are applied to all of that uh, with the teachings. So there's uh, the responsibilities of the men and responsibilities of the women that are all all combined in this. Is there something else you would like me to say? <laughs> I think you touched on many good points. I heard policy and history. I heard a little bit about your experiences, how you entered into seed keeping and then realized, whoa, you know, this is seed keeping, this is a responsibility, but that you never labeled yourself as a seed keeper, perhaps. Um, and I liked how you said being okay with it. Like, it's not just you being okay with it. It is your community being okay with it. It is, um, I guess, the, the governmental bodies being okay with our, our, our systems of knowledge, you know, like, um, we own those. those, those teach us so many things. And just being near the corn and being, being near the seeds and plants and outdoors near the river ecologies, those teach us. Just being near those things teaches us so much. And so I like how you wrapped your head around just being okay with it and then continuing your duty and continuing the seasonal cycles of seed keeping. So I appreciate that a lot. We have a good question and I wanted to um, offer it up from Buffy and the question is at home from the callers at home how do we begin our relationship with our own ancestral corn and how do we begin our relationship with the traditional corn from the lands we find ourselves living in now so knowing that the corn that we grew at home and the soil that we grew back in a homeland may be different than the soil that we're growing in now and the corn that is available to us now so um, Deb would you like to start us off there that's a great question. Um, we, we, we realized that um, with our corn, the Pawnee corn, uh, how it grows in our homeland is definitely different than how it is now in where we are established in Oklahoma. Um, so a lot of it, um, you just need to adapt um, using as much as of the traditional methods that you can incorporate. Um, and for, for the Pawnees, um, the best way that I like to use is the uh, hilling method or, or making mounds. And um, uh, in Nebraska, our homeland, uh, the mounds are real simple. and and we are able to use, utilize the, the soil, the existing soil that's there. Um, but down here in Oklahoma, where the soil is so hard packed and uh, clay, uh, we, we, we've had to adapt that. Um, we still use um, the mound method, um, but now it's 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 more shaping um using it as the sides and and the um i don't know the the make it like a bowl and then we we do uh, 
utilize um, mulch in the middle so that we can have the drainage. Um, and, and that's really for us, it, it's kind of the, the best method down here to use. It's, it's almost like um, making your own pottery or your, your own pots, uh, but they're all side by side and, and there's uh, like in my front yard, I have 56 mounds and um, have been able to plant um, five holes of corn and, and some uh, beans. Now we use bush beans. Um, I was intrigued by what Stephen was saying about the climbing beans that he uses. Um, and uh, I've never uh, used those before, but um, I do appreciate our, our bush beans because especially in Oklahoma where it's so hot and the soil gets very, very hot that the, the bush beans does a real lovely job in, in keeping the heat of the soil down. Um, but I think your, your best way to, um, to find out um, uh, a good practice in your area is just to network and see what others are doing and and um, uh, be open. So thank you for that, Deb. Yes, um, and I'd like to welcome Angela Ferguson to the call. Yeah, to see you. I can tell you've been out working, and I I knew that's how you'd roll in and be with us today. Angela, do you mind introducing yourself now um, and telling us where you're from? And um, we're just doing some general conversations and some big questions about seed keeping today, but I'd love to check in with you. So, there she is, you just have to unmute. I think I got this now. <laughs> okay, awesome. Yeah, good to see your face. Hello. Hi. I'm at the farm, as a matter of fact. I'm not very tech technologically savvy. You have a little bit of a connection, so we're glad to hear, hear from you from the farm. Um, one of the first things that we were touching in on is how um, your seed keeping has um, built within you relational skills with your community and maybe um, you've learned things about how to teach others how to be around seed keeping just by doing and so I'd love to hear your introduction and maybe how you approach teaching by doing as a seed keeper. Okay, um, I'm Angela Ferguson. I'm the uh, farm manager over here at the Onondaga Nation and um, I'm glad to be a part of this. Thanks for inviting me. I don't, I don't get an opportunity to do these a lot, but um, I guess this is our new normal. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure what you wanted me to touch on, but um, I'm really excited about this year because since the pandemic, you know, we have about twice as many gardens here in Onondaga and we planted um, twice as many things that we normally do here at the farm, but also in the community as well, you know, down in uh, individual gardens. So we've had a lot of um, first time growers and um, many seed keepers from previous years that have come up here for workshops and stuff, um, coming to grow out many different varieties. So we're all communicating to, um, let each other know what we're growing so that um, things don't cross pollinate. And people are learning a lot about um, planting times and when that pollen actually drops. And so people have learned a lot of um, different techniques of how to plant more than one variety without um, cross pollinating them. Thank you. I think there's some very valuable teachings in um, just what the natural world always already offers and already does. And I see that with um, more gardeners incorporating pollinator strips into their garden as a practice, as, an, um, as a practice for every new garden. I think that's a really beautiful thing, that acknowledgement of um, how, 
how the insects and the flowers and the, the, the harvesting and the corn, you know, the silk tasseling, it all works together. It all works together. And we've touched on it a little, but as seed keepers, we, we do have a responsibility as culture bearers as well. Um, and we know that we are in a position as part of a larger system of what our cultures could be and are and the things that we still practice. So um, can you tell me a little bit about how seed keeping could contribute to your contemporary culture, your community now? Um, it's a big question. I've asked some systemics some big questions this morning, but really just how that protocol of ceremony, that protocol of your being in your culture, how it translates to your gardens. And I'll go ahead and start with Stephen on that one. I think he might be muted. Steven. <laughs> he, he might be muted right now. Okay. Um, Leah, can I go to you about protocol and things that you know about um, just being near ceremony and then maybe some of that alignment with being near the garden. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think um, as more people get involved with Ohe Logu, they also get drawn to attending ceremonies. So there are people in our co-op that had never attended ceremonies before um, participating with the corn, um, learning how to grow it, learning how to harvest it. Um, but that experience sort of brought them back to the longhouse. So that's really beautiful to see um, that you know, it can kind of go either way. Either you're in the longhouse and you're realizing a lot of these ceremonies are about corn or you're out in the field and you're realizing, wow, this is really sacred. I should probably go to the longhouse um, because there's a lot of um, aspects outside of just planting and harvesting that we do ceremonially um, to maintain that good relationship and to give thanks. Um, and so it's been really nice to see that. And then we also have a rites of passage group that got started um, copying what was going on in mm -hmm. Aquasesne and so they're able to participate more now with the corn by partnering with Ohilagu. Um, and we're developing an, now an online uh, training program for them. We were going to do it in person, but COVID kind of bashed those plans. So we're developing videos so they can learn about outside the ceremonial process, how you put those um, teachings into practice. Nice. Yeah, go ahead, Deb. Oh, that's beautiful, Leah. Um, I we 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 it seems like uh, we're always introducing new people to the garden and i i just love uh, how well connected they they are um we have uh, americorps working with us right now there's 15 and what a crew i mean they are so hard working um it is nice that every day they, you know, start out in prayer and, and you know, do their, um, their work. And um, I don't know, it's just a real blessing to see all that. Uh, we would love to get to, uh, and we're actually moving on a, a project for working with our, our young women. Um, because we have a sister tribe, the Rikara, um, the ceremonies that we want to do for our, our, our young women, um, they need to be done exactly um, in how they do it in, in, in North Dakota as we, we would do it in Oklahoma. So we're, we're doing some uh, first stages of, of getting our stories together and curriculum for the young girls um and um yeah we really look forward to to that and then uh, we have workshops every friday and it's open to the public um, it's a master gardener uh program that we've adapted uh 
to also address our, our Pawnee Seed Preservation Project. Um, and we're working with a partner, our Oklahoma State University, which is really nice because they, they present their, um, all, all the science that they have going on and, and then we're able to really compare it with what, you know, the way we do things. And so we're appreciating each other. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate uh, Leah also sharing a, a resource, uh, the corn planting workshop on our Mighty Network. So check the chat if you're tuning in and you can get some resources as, as well as some great dialogue today. Thank you. Now, Stephen, I was going to leave it to you because um, when you talked earlier, you did mention you lean towards <laughs> protocol and protocol in growing and I just wanted to tie that to ceremony a little bit. And um, I remember you last year at our regional food summit in a downtime and a quiet time and in, in between um, meetings and, and sessions, you started singing and I really appreciated your songs. And um, I just wanted to acknowledge that and hear from you about how you see gardening protocol as similar to ceremonial protocol. Okay. Um... And if you can see my corn, I brought this from Mexico uh, in, not long ago when I was there at the end of, uh, actually the 1st of March. And I was part of a um, uh, corn planting ceremony. One minute. Ask you to show you. Okay. Hello. There. We see your beautiful face. All right. All right. There's the corn. So I brought this corn from Mexico in, at the beginning of March, just before everything got shut down. I was there and uh, the women had a ceremony uh, for uh, very similar to what we do in the longhouse. And uh, they even dance very similar to the way the women dance in the longhouse, shuffling their feet. So mm -hmm. the name of the dance, it really, uh, they just call it in a, they call it woman's dance, but really the, traditional name is called Asida Garanye, meaning they're grinding their feet, which means they're covering the sacred seed, uh, which is the corn uh, in our mother, the earth. And also being one of uh, the faith keepers in, in my longhouse here in Ganawage, uh, that um, ceremonies are set out by how the corn is growing. Uh, so I have that responsibility too. So uh, so I get together with the other fate keepers when uh, at different stages of the corn from the time we begin to plant in the spring and when the corn is, is so high and we make the first hoeing, we have a ceremony uh, about hoeing the corn. And as it goes along, it goes through the green corn and the ripe corn, then the complete harvest. So those are like traditional things, traditional values apply to, to everything. You have to keep the, um, uh, maintain the awareness of all that and just, you know, because it is sacred, everything is sacred, everything that we do is sacred in the seed. And furthermore, the seed understands um, everything. And that's, the, that's one of the things that is uh, an indigenous knowledge that I'm, that I'm proud to say that I participate in. And I also pass this down to uh, <clears throat> other people uh, within the community. And uh, this year, like, uh, because of what's going on in the world. Uh, there are a lot of, lot of gardens. I've been doing um, <clears throat> webinars every Tuesday evening at six our time. I do radio programs. I go to a big field and I, I work with younger people. I instruct them and, and they've been following along. Uh, not just what I'm saying, but following along about the things that I have learned. So that's the thing that's different because you're sharing this knowledge as opposed to say, well, I'm telling you, you have to do this and you have to do that. No, 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 we don't do that. We show, that's how we teach. We, we show how, how I learned it from the older people and, and this is how it's, it's passed down. So we put all this thing together and sometimes you have to learn how to separate um, <clears throat> some parts because sometimes people think it becomes religious and so on. So you don't wanna, you don't wanna impose yourself, but you wanna educate and sometimes it's good uh, for, for them to learn, but when they go along, they, it just, it works hand in hand. So it's a beautiful thing that uh, this knowledge that's acquired. So here, 
our, our ceremonies in the long holes are basically set around the corn. Uh, the different varieties that we grow, the different varieties that we maintain. Uh, so I said in the fall, we gather and then we braid our corn. And from there, that's where we're selecting what we consider uh, what we want to use as a seed in the next next year. And at that time, we, we celebrate by singing and dancing in the long house at Harvest Dance and carried on through the midwinter for the ceremonies there and again back to the springtime. So it's a complete... Uh, um, it uh, complete the cycle, the yearly cycle. Well, but it's um, it's hand in hand that coincides with corn because all our rituals are based upon the corn, the, especially the food, the food part of it. Thank you. I appreciate that, um, and I appreciate your acknowledgement of the way we are near the garden and sharing knowledge. It's not in dominion over one another. It is to be sharing, to perpetuate those seeds and perpetuate that ceremony. And I really appreciate that um, when you think of the younger people and the people who have not been around a garden before in their lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. And um, you brought no, up something, Mex Mexico and our relatives in Mexico and their vast seed knowledge, which is so valuable. Um, how to prepare the foods, those things that after harvest, things that come after harvest, um, which will be knowledgeable to, to get us eating a little healthier too. I appreciate that because I do get questions from our, our college age students um, who come to our native youth into ag summits about why don't we talk about our relationship with Mexico? Do you, do you, and, and then they bring that up and I appreciate the youth who are doing that and keep asking those good questions. So thank yeah. you. And I'm, yeah, gonna yeah. Thank give, you. Okay, I'm gonna give Angela just a little bit of time. I mean, I'm, uh, take as much time as you need, Angela. We have about eight minutes left um, and I was going to take a, a question from the crowd after that and then close out. So Angela, if you just want to talk a little bit about the work and how the work is not just work, the work is being in connection to your, your seed, the earth and ceremony. Okay. Um, well, our farm that we have here is actually, um, the role that it plays in our community is actually an ancient role that used to be something that was familiar to all Haudenosaunee people. And so communal gardening was actually our way of life. And so I'm very thankful that my nation supports our, um, our endeavor up here because the goal of our, our, not only the seed keeping, but the planting of the food, the food preparation, the beekeeping, the medicine gathering, um, just all of the different, uh, you know, maple sap in the, in the early winter, you know, when winter, when, when the, Midwinter ceremonies are over is usually around our maple sap time. So um, there's all different things throughout the year that we do here that all coincides with our traditional teachings. And um, it's really valuable tool in the summertime for us. Usually we have our youth group up here or we uh, mentor youth throughout the year. And so last year we had a, a pretty large group up here and it's really awesome to see this year that a lot of them kept their own seeds you know, they learn how to properly um, keep, uh, take care of the seeds and to store them for uh, planting in the springtime. And so they were able to actually put those in their own gardens. Uh, we also had a, a garden at the nation school where we taught the children that, you know, yes, you can eat some of your food, but you always wanna make sure you keep some of the seeds for the following year to plant again. So we're trying to instill that as a very early value. And um, it's really exciting to see. Um, when the pandemic first started, uh, everybody went into panic mode. And um, what was happening, I guess you could say for us, is that um, we, uh, we had enough food put away. So our people really weren't in a, in a panic mode or, you know, that kind of uh, thought process, I guess, you know, because we also do... Um, you know, we do butchering and we have hunting and fishing as part of our, it's more of a food sovereignty program in, in addition to the farm. So we kind of play uh, many roles here, you know, not just the planting, but with the communal gardening that always ensures that we have enough uh, corn, beans and squash, sunflower seeds, tobacco, things that we're going to need uh, that all ties in with the ceremonies at our longhouses. And you know, we're reinstilling the value of also sharing and introducing our food um, through a bartering network, you know, through trade, where 
there isn't a necessity for uh, an American dollar, you know, to have value to your farm or your gardens. That if another farmer may be growing something that you need or that, you know, you didn't happen to plant that year, um, we're reopening those networks of trade. Oh, that's really exciting too. Um, one of the things that I had ex experienced this year is that uh, our weeds got really long and um, in our, one of our teachings, they talk about there are two medicines, you know, for the corn. And I've always um, used one of them and I never really knew what the other one was. It was kind of, uh, you know, some people remembered, some people didn't, some people weren't sure what it was called. We couldn't find an actual translation of the word. And uh, I was able to have one of my friends from the Seneca language immersion program take it back to an elder and, and um, find the translation. And the medicine was growing right here at the farm all along. So um, we were able to use that in our planting and it was pretty amazing to mix them together and to see that um, the corn came up in like two days. <laughs> the hulls were like opening right away on the corn and it was like, it was almost like you had to hurry to plant and um, the birds never, could, this is the first time in almost 10 years that the birds never ate anything out of our whole field. Usually we have to replant because they always get a little bit and um, not this time. So um, I'm glad they had mercy on us anyway, because last year we had to replant almost four times to, to fill in what they got out of our gardens, even with the, with the medicine on the corn. But with this new one, um, you know, we've, we've been forced to pause and kind of step, step back a little bit and reevaluate what's um, really important to us. And it seems like if you look even, um, you know, all over Turtle Island, it's food. It's our foods are finally um, humbling us again. And that connection in the gardens, now that the kids aren't in school, they have plenty of time to be in the gardens. And that's been such an enjoyable uh, experience for them too. So I, I couldn't be more thankful. I mean, out of something bad, something good always comes. And so all the things that we wanted to see, which was more children in the garden, um, we wanted to have more herbalists out there, you know, uh, working with the medicines and that's happening and it's amazing and then with the gardens you know everybody's planting more in different varieties and communicating and and kind of just getting back to who we are so for me personally um, I think that's the one good thing that has come out of all this. Thank you Angela. Um, I love you talking on all the good things that, that do come out of being near the seed. Um, I can feel those things. I'm, I, I see those happening in my own home community. And um, as seed keepers, it's really beautiful that we, you know, us on the panel here and a few other ones I can think of across the nation, they are connected to their home communities. They do live among their people. And so um, I did have a great question from Harmony on the chat today. She wanted to know what are our recommendations for communities that have lost ancestral seed? And so the first thing that popped to my mind was that term rematriation. Um, also getting to know your university, like mentioned, um, dad, and uh, I think a few of us have worked with university settings and people, but what would be your recommendations for communities that have lost their own ancestral seed? Angela, if you wanna take that one. Um, is that, was that question for me? Yeah, I'm just gonna kick it off to you and then, and then um, kind of let the others reflect on, on recommendations for people that have lost ancestral seed. Okay. Um, well, I think a lot of the um, the seed the seed networks now, um, uh, you know, through the communication and traveling and the different communities that we've held these different food summits. Um, Braiding the Secret has had corn gatherings there. Um, it's almost like the seeds guide you to to the people, you know. And so, um, the people that are carrying those seeds, you know, whether that's three or four varieties or strains, or maybe somebody may have hundreds or thousands or whatever. Um, some, at some point there's, there's some kind of force working behind the scenes, I feel like, drawing those people to you. So those seeds are carrying that energy, you know, that energy of our ancestors. And um, I think one of the examples for me is like, when I was um, in one of our 
you know, seed collections that we have here in Onondaga, I was, I, two of these jars just kept looking at me kind of, and I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll, I'll take those with me to the uh, Gun Lake Food Summit. And I took it with me there and didn't really have a reason why, but it was like they wanted to come. So I, I brought them there and the seeds themselves were um, a variety of Miami corn. And when I got there, I had two jars, two little jars. They were both Miami varieties. And when I got there, I met this woman I kind of clicked with and we got to talking and um, we went and sat after the, the presentation. And I said, well, where are you from? And she said, well, I'm Miami. And I was like, wow, how strange. So, you know, I ran back and I, I grabbed those jars. I said, I got to go get something out of my room. And I brought it back to her. And she was an apprentice to an elder that was teaching her um, how to keep their Miami varieties of traditional foods going. And they were both farmers. So I, when I showed them the seeds, they were so excited. You know, it was like a long lost relative came. So I think the importance of us, um, you know, being open to meeting people and having these relationships, one person might lead you to the next because it seems like, um, you know, as native people, a lot of, a lot of people are, um, really getting back into this agriculture thing now and, and now realizing that seed keeping is the, ba the basis for that. You know, you need a base to your home and that's kind of what it is. And for me personally, it's been through personal relationships of meeting people. And um, it's been very, I'm very thankful to see those seeds when they get rematriated like that back to their home communities because that's where they thrive and do the best when it comes to growing. Thank you, Angela. I appreciate that. It uh, looks like we're closing in on our time, but I was going to let um, Leah go ahead and answer uh, Harmony's question live if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. So another couple of different resources for you that might have various levels of success based on how long seeds have been kept in various collections. If you're not able to connect with somebody who has uh, living seeds that they've been taking care of, the USDA does have an extensive seed bank um, and they have a lot of tribe seeds in there just from the length of time that they've been collecting these seeds. And all it takes is a letter um, to write to them and, and request some of those seeds. Um, and people have had varying degrees of luck with that, but it's sort of a long shot. It's something that you could try. Um, something else you might try is actually just looking at a, a regular seed catalog from a company. Unfortunately, a lot of native seeds are being sold by um, bigger name brands. And so you may be able to you know, work with them, or if it comes down to it, buy your seeds back so you can start growing them. Um, and then universities and museums also have vast seed collections that have native corns in them. So if you don't know where it is, not all hope, not all hope is lost. Um, if you don't have an ability to connect with a seed keeper in your community or with elders in your community that might know who has seeds, um, those are some institutional options that you can try to. Thank you, beautiful answer. I appreciate that. Um, we're getting a lot of love from our, our, our community out there. So thank you for spending your time with us today as panelists. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, is there anything else you want to you wanna say before we sign off? I know Dan's ready to um, share some Indian Ag resiliency words. And I just wanted to give you an, a chance to say goodbye or, or see you later in your language if you'd like. Um, so, Deb? Oh. God bless everybody. Thanks. Spirit of our ancestors, may the blessings be. Thank you. And Stephen? Yes. Um, happy summer solstice is today. So uh, we had a cer ceremony in our community of shooting arrows uh, at the sun. It's an ancient ceremony that our, our people have done since who knows. But it marks, denotes the beginning of summer and uh, the height of the sun in the sky. So that is very important to, to maintain uh, these old ways. And it's all in regards to uh, the continuance of life. So I wish everybody a good summer, a uh, good growing season. Um, yeah, just to answer that thing very quickly, uh, if you lost your own uh, varieties, uh, a neighboring uh, nation uh, may have similar things that your people had at one time. And so that's another place that you can explore. So everyone, good luck, and uh, we'll catch you next time. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. And uh, Daniel, go ahead. And um, I know you've been doing some no-till planting, even as of last night. 
Um, so uh, I yeah, mm -hmm. I just, uh, I've been planting with some different methods this year and um, using a, a four row no-till planter. I'm going to have some information up on our e-learning platform on that. Uh, one of my friends had uh, got a drone, so we took some drone footage and um, have some different angles. That was planting a red lake corn. I just want to just follow up quick on something Leah had mentioned too. I requested some seeds from USDA this year, and there's just an online, you just go online and you can do it. You, they kind of want you to have some credentials and, and whatnot, but uh, I, got, I got all the corns I requested. I didn't get any of the beans or the other seeds, but um, I've grown, there's one I didn't grow, I grew the six other ones and all of them had good germination rates. So um, good, good success on there. Um, I do wanna thank our panelists. This, is, this has been great, very informative. And then I wanna, um, I'd like to direct our audience to additional resources. Our e-learning platform, that's where we've got the, the workshop, the, the on-demand recorded workshops for, for this food summit. So uh, register for the event, you can get more info there, but we have uh, Rowan White had done a very nice presentation on seed saving for the three sisters. There's an extensive amount of information there. We also have a couple of other documents that Rowan had compiled that are, are part of that lesson in the Virtual Food Summit and, and my networks. Um, and then the other resource that we have on there is uh, Claire Luby is a um, is a instructor at the University of Wisconsin Madison, and she had done a similar presentation for world vegetable crops. So if you want to know where carrots come from or uh, onions, all those different vegetables that you see at the store, they all have stories of where they came from too. And so uh, Claire had, had done a presentation of providing some more background on, on there. So those are a couple of additional resources in addition to, to what Leah had referenced. And we'll keep on putting more content up on that, on that e-learning platform. Again, it's a, you know, register for the event or go to mightynetworks.com, search for Intertribal Agriculture Council. We need to approve you. Part of why we have an approval is we don't just want anybody going and getting a lot of this information is really designed more for, for tribal community members. So we apologize, there's an extra step to get in there, but it's to protect that information. And we'll have a bunch more, um, a bunch more resources that'll be going into, into that platform as we move forward. So again, thank you to our panel. This has been fantastic. We've got our next panel is going to be starting in about 20 minutes. It's uh, um, we're going to be joined by several of our producers. So um, be some great, uh, great information as part of that one. We have a little, uh, a little um, addition for that panel of one of our panels. Be doing another, uh, another uh, live plant walk to conclude that panel. So. We'll see you again in about uh, in about 20 minutes. If you if you need to register for the event, it's very easy. Go to Intertribal Food Summit 2020.eventbrite.com. No cost for registration, um, and then you'll get then you'll get more information. And just as we close here, just leave you with our poster. These are the uh, these are these are the the list of all of the workshops that are on that e-learning platform. And then, uh, and then you can see the live sessions as well. Thank you, and we'll talk again in about 20 minutes. Thank you, Kristen. She had it. I appreciate you. Thank you.